week's Torah portion is all about Abraham mm. and his story. And it's really the story of Chesed, the story of kindness. I want to start off with telling you an amazing story of kindness that recently happened that touched my heart. And I'm almost certain it's going to touch yours as well. This was heard by Rabbi Shneel Ashkenazi, who's a big, big rabbi in Israel, um, Chabad rabbi. And uh, he shares an amazing story, and I was so touched by it, I want to share it with you as well. So there's this widow who lives in uh, New York, and an, now an older lady, but she was a widow for many years. And for her, Passover is her favorite time of the year because all her grandkids and kids moved to Israel. And for her, Passover is the time of the year she pays, spends all her money that she makes that year. She has to work and she, stay, she still lives here, otherwise she would go and live with her family. Pays everything, all her money, every year to bring all her grandkids back to her every year so that she can do Passover with them. And this year was COVID. Can you imagine? All her grandkids were meant to come. She paid for all the tickets. Boom, everything's canceled. No one's coming home. And here we have a widow for the first time in many, many years is now going to have Passover by herself. And she was devastated. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What's going to be this year Passover? How am I going to sing um, Manish Tana to myself? How am I going to dip the maror by myself? How am I going to eat the matzah by myself? What am I going to do? She buys everything. And a day before Passover, her neighbor knocks on her door and says to her, listen, I know that you're alone and you're normally with your family. Why don't you join us? I know that you can't come in our house because the laws are very strict right now, but at least sit outside from the door and join our family. I have kids. It's us, me, my wife. Please bring your food that you have, that you prepared for your Passover. Bring a small table. I'll help you. And you sit outside our door and at least we'll bring our table close to the door and we'll do Passover like that together. And she was amazed. She said, of course, that's such a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. She go, sets the table, they set the table, and she's sitting outside on the stairway doing Manishtana and all of Passover together with this family. And she is not just amazed, but in shock. Her husband is brought back to life. She starts hearing all the songs that she heard when her husband was alive. All the kids are saying the same stories that she heard when she was a kid, when she, when she had her little kids. It, everything was like as if her husband came back to life and her kids were with her. It was insane. Same tunes, same customs, same everything. And she just couldn't believe it. She had the most amazing Passover. True story just this year. The most amazing Passover and Passover continues. She cannot wait for Passover to end so she can call her children in Israel and tell them what happened, that she had the most amazing Passover, so inspiring, it reminded her of when she, her husband was alive and she had her kids at home. And she calls, eventually Passover ends, she calls her son and tells him, listen, you wouldn't believe it. There's a neighbor, you know that neighbor? He invited me and I had the most amazing Passover, sang all the tunes that we sing, knows all the words, everything, because, you know, there's many customs. Every single thing that we do, he did. I've never had such an amazing experience. And the guy says, uh, her son tells her, you, you just don't know what a special neighbor you have. Just before Passover, he calls me up and he tells me, I know that your mother's going to be alone. Please tell me all the tunes and teach me all the tunes that your father did. Please teach me all the customs and all the questions that you asked your children, that your father asked you. Teach us all of those things. Please just tell me everything so that I can give your mother the most amazing experience possible. And I taught him everything. And this is what happened. And she was obviously amazed. My friends, I just want to, I'm saying this story because chesed, kindness, is something so small that may seem so insignificant. A phone call to the son of this lady can change her life. She was meant to be alone in a depressing state. But because that son, that neighbor called her son and found out the truths, he changed her life. Like, 
one word of empathy can change somebody's life. And that's really the message here. I'll share with you one more story. You know, in, in, during the Holocaust, there were 6,000 Jews. This is an unknown story, meaning it's, there's no Schindler movie made out of this. Not yet. Maybe there is, but I don't know of it. But there's uh, one of the diplomats in Japan. His name was Sugihara. I'm sure you've heard of him. Saved 6,000 Jews during the Holocaust. Gave them all visas illegally. Had his family and his life on the line. He gave 6,000 Jews uh, visas and managed to take them out of the depths of the Holocaust of Poland, give them visas and bring them through to Japan. And from there, the greatest yeshiva institution till today was founded. There were 400 students studying in the Me yeshiva, which they made in Japan. They literally made a yeshiva during the Holocaust in Japan. And there were 400 young men studying there. Amongst them was also some very holy rabbis as well. You could even say that the most of the religious Jewry that there is today is because of um, that group that was sent through Sugihara to, through Japan. So you can imagine that this was an amazing man. What inspired him? You know, you've got a, a man from Japan uh, who's a diplomat. What inspired him to put his own life at risk to save 6,000 people and give them free visas to come to, um, to, to Japan? And the story's told that uh, there was a kid, the backstory of this, which is well known as well. There was a kid, a Jewish kid called Sully Ganor. And Sully Ganor lived in Lithuania. And this diplomat, Sugihara from Japan, used to go to Lithuania and back a lot because of his job in terms of the government with Japan. And he, he was mainly based in Europe. So he used to go back and forth from Lithuania. Lithuania wasn't hurt from the Holocaust only until later on. And... Um, he goes, he's in Lithuania, and as he's uh, walking to the store, there, there was this kid, Sully Gano, and he was asking his aunt for money. He said to his aunt, I know that you gave me all that money last week for Hanukkah, it was Hanukkah time. I know that you gave me all this money for Hanukkah, but people from Poland, uh, people were asking for money, charity for the Jews in Poland, because, you know, they're all going through the Holocaust and people are starving. I gave all of that gift money you gave me, I gave it to people that knocked on my door, I don't have any more money. A little kid, Sully Gano, and he asks his aunt in the store, please give me another few coins so I can go to the movies with my friends and watch something on Hanukkah. So uh, Sully Gano is sitting there with his aunt and his aunt's like, well, you spent all the money. I gave you a lot and you gave it all away. So I'm sorry. And whilst Sully Gano was handling with his aunt, this guy, Sugihara, was in that store. And he hears, the st he hears what was going on. He hears the argument. And he says to Sully Gano, I'll give you a few uh, coins for whatever you need. And he gave it him. Sully Gano, this Sugiara gave him the coins. And Sully was so in, so in shock from the kindness. He says to him, listen, our family is doing a party for Hanukkah. Please come and join our Hanukkah party. So... Uh, uh, Sugiara says, you know what, okay, Le never, never been to a Jewish event before, I'll come. So Sully Gano takes the coins, he's happy, he goes to the movies, and a few days later on Hanukkah, uh, the party happens and Sugihara comes in and he's amazed at this family. Small little home, uh, having a little party amongst themselves, and he's just amazed at the Jewish tradition and how they... Uh, celebrate Hanukkah and the way that they speak and the, the way that the kids were behaving. He was absolutely amazed. And eventually, um, you know, Sugiara moved back, went back to Japan, and he was giving visas to 6,000 people that were Jewish. And it was his first experience. That was Sugiara's first experience with Jewish people. And um, from that story as well, you see that just a small thing. This kid, Sully Gano, who, you know, uh, I'll give you a few coins, Sugihara says. And then Sully Gano says, can you come to my Hanukkah? If he could have just said nothing and just said thank you and walked off. But he said, no, you come to my Hanukkah party. I want you to come. And that little act, that little word saved 6,000 Jews. It's amazing. We don't realize that it's like planting a seed. Chesed. 
is like planting a seed. Saying hello to someone can save somebody from suicide. Saying, I hope you're, how are you doing? Or giving somebody a phone call that's not doing too well can literally save a suicide. It's a matter of life and death. Life and death is in the hands of the tongue. What kind of tongue? The tongue of chesed. If somebody just gives the right word in the right time, boom. And it's a small thing. It's like the seed. When you plant a seed in the ground, you know how many apples are going to come out of that, that seed? You don't know. It can give you 100,000 trees from that one seed in the ground. You don't know. That's what chesed is. So that's what I want to talk about tonight, which is transforming our view of what chesed really is based on this week's Torah portion, okay? So here's the Torah portion. I know that you all know the story, or I hope so, but either way, I'll go over it again and remind you of this amazing story, but it's uh, really mind-blowing, okay? So Abraham's on his, he's 100 years old, and he's on his third day after he has his Brit Mila. Okay, we spoke about challenges. One of his challenges was he went through a surgery. He had Brit Mila. That was one of his challenges of life. At some point, everybody goes through some kind of surgery, health. And Abram was on that stage. He was 100 years old. And it was the third day after he had his circumcision. And God comes to visit him. Why? Our rabbis teach us. This is a Gemara in Sota, Yudalad Amodalaf, page 14a. From here, from the fact that God comes to visit Hashem, uh, that's what it means, Vayera. This week's portion is called Vayera. And he appeared, God appeared to Abraham whilst he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And our rabbis teach us from here, we learn that God comes and visits the sick. Hashem makes, you, makes the person sick in the first place. It's another discussion. But he comes and sits with you. He's with you in your pain. We, we learn from here that there's a, a certain way of God which is to come and visit the sick. According to Judaism, the synagogue's holy and so is the hospital. Did you know that? A hospital where people are sick is a very spiritual place. And it's considered a very holy place in Judaism. So one of the reasons is because God's there. He's there accompanying everybody that's there and sick. So he's sick and he's sitting with uh, God. And Abraham's having this prophecy. And he sees in the far distance, he lifts his eyes, he sees three people coming towards him. And he, it says he sees again. He takes note that they're questioning whether they should come, right? That's a very important lesson, by the way, in life as well. Never look once. Look twice. It's not just about reacting quickly. It's reacting quickly with thought. Abram didn't just react and say, oh, quick. He, react, he looked and then he looked again. In life, you've got to always look twice at things. Be quick. Be hasty. But look twice. And Abram looks twice and he runs out of his tent and he goes to sit with, uh, invite these, these guests, these three people that were actually angels coming to do certain jobs, dressed as uh, Arabs, uh, coming to visit his tent. And Abraham runs out of his tent and he says, please, my masters, my gods, my masters, please, don't just leave me. Come, come. Take a bit of water and bread. I will feed you. Then you can keep going. Abram starts his words of chesed. He starts being kind. And our rabbis teach us here, this is the most mind-blowing thing you'll ever hear. This is the most mind-blowing thing. So Talmud in Shabbat, page 127a. It says, from here we learn how great it is to invite guests into your home. Why? Because Abraham left God. He was, God came to visit him whilst he's sick. And he's talking to Hashem. Abraham left to visit, to go and get guests. He's like, Hashem, I know you're around. This is Judaism, by the way. We'd rather do a mitzvah than be with God. Which religion does that? Does that make sense to you? If not for Torah, I wouldn't have believed this. Insane. Abraham's sitting with Hashem and he's like, goodbye. I've got to see you. This is what the rabbis say. Greater is 
inviting guests than sitting with the divine providence of God. Because it says that Abraham ran off and he said, please, my masters, please, if you don't, if you don't mind, don't just leave. Take a bit of water and, and, some, and wash your feet and sit with me. By the way, he said, take a bit of water and some bread. What did he serve them? He served them bread, butter, cheese, milk. Then he gave them meat, the most tender of meat. He said a little and did much more. It's another lesson that our rabbis teach us. In life, you should say a little and do much more. Never give high expectations to people around you. Give low expectations and deliver much more. There's a, say, there's a saying for that, right? Um, there's a saying for that. Say a little and uh, don't over de deliver and, and over deliver. Something to do with deliver. Has anyone Eat heard that? Softly carry a big stick. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Never mind. Okay, but that's, uh, this is the, the statement here. So we see a tremendous thing. Now, the question obviously is, how can it be? How can it be that kindness is so great that you'd rather invite guests than be in the presence of Hashem? How can that be? How, how does that make sense? You'd rather do chesed than be with God. And what's fascinating is, okay, so these three angels come and they tell him, they tell Abraham that this time next year, you're going to have a son. This time next year, you are going to have a son. And there's a thousand lessons here. I, I feel so bad jumping all of these powerful life messages that are hidden in this story. It's, it's, it's insane. Every time I learn it, I'm ecstatic. So he, he, he feeds them gives them so much food. Abraham does it himself, the wealthiest man, one of the most powerful people in the world, right? Can you imagine the most powerful person in the world? He beat Nimrod, who was the greatest people of that generation. Abraham was the most powerful man in, uh, in his time. And he, he had everything, wealth, everything. Beat nine kingdoms. He was the wealthiest. And yet Abraham went and served these guests himself. How humble is that? Which kind of leader would do that? Could you imagine if uh, my tire is broken on the side of the, the sidewalk, my tire is torn, uh, you know, punctured, and all of a sudden a president comes out and says, hey, you're stuck with your tire, let me help you, and starts doing himself. He says, no, no, I don't want help. I don't need my secret service to help me help you. I'll do it. Never would you see such a thing. Abram was the leader of, that pe of the people of that time. And yet went himself to serve these guests. He was desperate for guests in his sickness. Whilst he was sick, we can understand just to appreciate how much chesed was in this person. This angel called Avraham Avinu. How much kindness was deep embedded within him. So it says that he ran, he got some food, he gave it to his child to teach him how to do it. Also teaches us a lesson in chinuch, in education. And they are told that they are going to have a child. At this point, Abraham knows that these people are angels. He knows they're angels. And do you know what happens? So that he's told that this time next year, you're going to have a child. And he gets told that. And then this is, this is the mind-blowing thing. So all this happens. A lot of stuff happens here. Amazing stuff. But it ends off. It ends off in the most profound way. These three people got up and they moved on to Sodom. And Abraham holech imam, Abraham holech imam le A few verses later, verse 16, um, Abraham accompanies them. And from here, our rabbis teach us that Abraham didn't just feed them and eat them and give them to eat. He even accompanied them. He accompanied them out. Now, wait a second. Why is he doing chesed accompanying these people if they're angels? He knew that they're angels now. So why are you accompanying them? No, he had to accompany them. What for? He accompanied. From here, Maimonides, listen to this. This is going to be the most... I want to change, transform the way we think of chesed. This is my aim for tonight in the small time that we have because it's mind-blowing. So... Our rabbi, uh, uh, Maimonides says, it's based on the Talmud and a few other places. But Maimonides says, The reward of accompanying 
a guest is greater than feeding the guest. It's greater than everything. The greatest part of chesed, of kindness, is accompanying your guest outside the door. Do, you, do, do any of you do that? You have someone come to your house, you escort them out the door? You do that? Maimonides says that's the biggest mitzvah of chesed. More than feeding the person. You can have a random guy in the street. You bring him in, feed him, give him to eat. Fine. Right? As long as you know you're going to be safe with that person. But you give them to eat. You, and then you don't only feed them. You escort them out the door. You walk them out. The question is how far do you have to walk them out? Out your door. Some see people say further than your entrance of your... There's a great discussion of how far you have to accompany this person. But one thing's for sure. Everyone agrees that accompanying the person out, that's greater than all the chesed you did beforehand. That is, that's extreme. Wait a second. I could feed the person like Abraham did. He fed them food. He fed them milk, cheese, Everything, he gave them a milky meal first. Then he gave them the best meat from each animal to three different people. So he got three different animals, got the best meat from each one of them, the filet mignon, the tongue of each animal to each one of them. So he got three different tender animals for each one. And so much food. I, I don't get it. Accompanying them on the way out is greater than feeding them when you're in your house. Why? Why is accompanying somebody on the way out so much greater? So this is what I want to discuss, is why is accompanying so much greater and what really is chesed? Because those two stories that I told you, especially the first one, is a story of something so small, insignificant, but does so much. How? So here, I want to show, share with you some of the most greatest philosophy, obviously based off the Torah, by Rabbi Eliyahu, Desla, who lived through uh, last century. Okay, so he uh, wrote some extensive work and he wrote on amazing stuff. And he wrote on the Torah portions as well. And he says like this, listen to this, mind-blowing stuff. You ready? Ready for some more mind-blowing Torah? Listen to this. We're taught in Chovot HaLevavot, which is a book that's written about a thousand years ago, that there's two things. There's being compassionate and there's being kind. True? What's the difference? What's compassion? Rachmanut in Hebrew, but what does that really mean? What does compassion really mean? Can anyone tell me what it means that you're compassionate? Just, just, just define the word to be compassionate. Can someone define a good, good definition? You can Google it. Is it like showing empathy, showing care? Exactly. Like really showing, showing care and, and sympathy as well, as well, right, for that other person. Okay, so you, you basically, there's a, situ, a scenario that's going on externally that's causing you to have compassion. So the Talmud says there's three ways where the, that kindness is greater than charity. One is that charity is done with money. Charity is done with money, whilst kindness is not just money. It's also with your soul. Staka is given to poor people only. Kindness is also done to poor and to the wealthy. You can be kind to somebody who's wealthy as well. Staka lechayim, staka, charity can only be done to somebody that's alive. When you give somebody money who's poor, you're only doing it whilst they are alive. Gmilut chasadim, however, kindness is something that can be done to somebody that's dead as well as somebody who's alive. You can be kind to them uh, after they pass by looking after their children. You can be kind to them by looking after their body, by burying them properly. These are all ways that you can be kind to somebody. Okay, it, if not, the Talmud says, if not for a kindness in one second, then the world wouldn't be able to exist. Meaning, if there wasn't kindness in the world every second as we exist, the world wouldn't be able to exist. So, here are a number of other points um, about chesed. We, we also know that charity is, is something that you do. Right? So you give charity, right? You give, how much are you required to give? Somebody wins 10% over 
Okay. <laughs> Did you, what happens if you win uh, $200 billion? 10% is not, it's nice, right? It's nice, but you could give more, right? You should give more. Exactly. Until how much? 20. Until 20. 20% 20 is a lot. Now, after that, you could also give more, but you're not required. Okay, so it's the, minimum 10 it, until 20. Does it say 10 to 20? Yes, ad, ad chomesh. Ad chomesh means until a fifth, which is 20%. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Now, what's very, very interesting is that kindness, en lehem shiur, it says that kindness is something that has no boundaries. That, that's not something which is measured. Charity is measured. Kindness is measured. You, you have to understand, if I give somebody $10 because they need it, right? I could be telling them, hey, here's the $10, but keep the change, you filthy animal, right? I could be saying in that way, or I could be saying, listen, here's $10, and I want you to give me a blessing. I want to give you a blessing that you should succeed, that you should never ask anyone again. You should never need money again. The Talmud says that somebody who gives charity gets six different blessings, six different energies that come on you for giving charity. However, if you're Mephaiso, if you speak nicely to the person when you give him charity, oh, then you get 11 different blessings. Okay? So it's not just about giving the money. It's about how you give the money. Now, how you give the money, that's chesed. Charity is taking out your pocket and giving the, the money. That's the first stage. But you know what? Some people do charity so that they can look good on Facebook. So that they can make a great video which will get a lot of followings. That's great. At least it pushes you to do something good. But the question is how you do it. It's not just what you do. The question is how you're doing it. That's what real chesed is. There's so much more to say. But here's the, ma the main message. Chesed is an internal drive. It's something which is from the soul. It's beyond the other person. I'm not just doing it for them. It's an eternal drive that I need for me because it makes me grow into being a better person. It makes me grow into being a more godly person. I don't necessarily grow through charity. I grow through chesed. Chesed is what elevates me. We always think about kindness is how much it gives to me. You know, the word venatnu, to give, in Hebrew, which is talking about giving, can be read both ways. Because when you give to somebody else, you actually receive back. The word venatnu is a, it's a call, I think it's, called, it's got a special name to it. Hi, Eitan. But it, uh, what's a word that you can read both ways? Peladram? What's that word called? Anyone know? Palindrome. 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 So a palindrome is a word, venatnu, to give. Natan, to give, is a palindrome. It can be read both ways. Why? Because when you give to somebody, you're actually getting back. What are you getting? You're elevated. That's the his. So now we can understand what's going on here. Okay? It makes sense for the sakes of chesed, an internal desire, whilst I'm sick, to be so driven to be kind. To Abram, I don't care about my situation. I don't even care that God's with me. I'm going to leave Hashem's presence so that I can be like God. It's great. By being a person of chesed, I'm being like God. By giving charity, I'm also, but not on the same level. Chesed allows me to be a giver just like God. And in this world, whilst we are alive, we'd much rather be like God than experience being with God. You can meditate all day about spirituality and great, but being like God is so much more. That's a whole new level. And that is the reason why Abram accompanied these people, even though they were angels. Angels, did, you know they're angels, so they don't even need food. You know that they're angels. The whole thing was an act for Abram to make him feel good. They didn't need the food. At the end, it wasn't even needed. But Abram finds out, oh my goodness, I did all this chesed for no reason. Because they were just angels. They were fake news. It was, it was just angels. I didn't even need to feed them. And at that point, he could have said, that's it. What was the point of all this? 
He didn't do that. He continued. He, co- he accompanied them out the door. Which is the greatest part of chesed. Because Abram was thinking what it does to him. Forget about who it is too. I don't need to think of, oh, if I give the poor person some money, he might use it for c- cigarettes. Okay, I should be wise with how I give things to people. That's definitely true. But it's not on my, it's to a certain extent. It's not my job to do all the research behind as long as I become a chesed. I become a Baal Chesed. There's a great rabbi that used to knock on doors. He wanted to open a yeshiva uh, in Israel after the Holocaust. He opened a yeshiva called the Panovich Yeshiva, still going till today. And he used to knock on people's doors. That's how, he, after the Holocaust, he wanted a yeshiva where Jews can get Torah education and, and study and come wise through the Torah that we can have rabbis and people that would guide our people. After the Holocaust, there was nothing. Fields. And it was in a place called Bnei Brak, a very religious neighborhood in Israel, right next to Tel Aviv. And he's looking for money. And he's going from door to door. And people used to tell him, Rabbi, it, I think you're dreaming. He used to respond, I might be dreaming, but I'm awake. He says, I'm awake. Maybe I'm dreaming. It's true. But I'm awake. I'm not going to give up. And not only did he not give up, he used to knock on doors. Someone asked him, Rabbi, what are you thinking every time you knock on somebody's door asking, please help me build this institution? Knocking on doors from door to door. No one has big money back then after the Holocaust. Pennies. Everyone was surviving on pennies. Knock from door to door. Rabbi, every time you knock on the door, what are you thinking? He said, you know what he said? I'm thinking to myself, I really hope they just don't answer. His internal embarrassment was so strong he his nature is so embarrassed to ask somebody to help for an organ for a non-profit it's for an organization to build an institution it was embarrassing for him but he overcame that embarrassment because of his need to give chesed an amazing story i'm a dream i might be dreaming but i'm awake i might be embarrassed i might not want the door open i might not want the other person to open that door but i'll still knock on the door Because I know that my internal drive for chesed is so strong. So, that's the story of that widow that was given at the beginning. It it wasn't the fact that the neighbor knocked on the door and said, come join me for Passover. That most people will do. The, The game changer wasn't that. It wasn't the game changer wasn't knocking on the door. It was the fact... Nothing miraculous. There was nothing special about this story. But it was human power. That this guy, this, this, this neighbor called up her son in Israel and tried to find out exactly what she needs. And what's, that's, that's chesed. That's going beyond doing that extra little, little bit that you wouldn't have had to do. That's a relationship of kindness. By the way, that's, how, that's what a real relationship is as well. It's not doing the things I have to because I have to in the relationship. Oh, I'll take the garbage, so I'll take the garbage. No, it's doing it because I love you and I'll do even more than that. That's called chesed. It's doing the things that I don't have to do. I didn't have to buy flowers for you. And I did. I didn't have to write that note, but I did. It's the things you don't have to do that mean so much. Not the things that you do anyway. And that's what it is in Judaism as well. So that energy of chesed, that's more important than being with Hashem because that makes you like Hashem. And being compatible to God is the greatest thing that you would want because really that's what we're created for, to transform ourselves to be God-like. And the way to do that is through chesed, through kindness, and through uh, what Abraham Avinu did. So I'm just going to continue for a few minutes. And tell you a few other things about tzedakah and chesed. This is also a uh, a Rashi commentary. And he says, um, it's a statement that's written down in En Yaakov, one of the Midrashim. Rabbi Leaza says, uh, tzedakah is only rewarded according to the kindness that's involved in it. Charity only reaps the reward of it based off the kindness that's involved in it. Very interesting. 
like we said, there's two parts to charity. There's charity, but the how you give it, that's, that's the soul of the kindness that you're doing. As it says, when you plant the seed, that's kindness. When you harvest, that's chesed. That's, sorry, when you plant, that's charity. When you harvest, that's kindness. Planting is just a tiny seed. It's an investment, right? Harvesting, what happens? That one seed gives you massive amounts, like an explosion of stuff. That's the time of harvesting. That's chesed. The, the joy of giving is the small, little big, it's the small little bit at the beginning. But the real joy of giving is the chesed that's involved in it. It's not just the unconscious giving. It's the giving that's consciously made. That's what makes chesed special. You can give somebody a, a, uh, a donation online or you could say... Um, Mazal Tov to somebody, or you could say MT on a, on a message, or you can give somebody a phone call. It's not, both people said Mazal Tov, but it's the way that you did it that matters. That's Chesed. So that's the soul. And Rashi, the commentary there, says like this, very interesting. The giving, that's the charity part, but the, the effort that's involved, that's the kindness. For instance, Taking somebody to your house, accompanying them to the house, or accompanying them in a way that allows them to be successful. Not just giving them, but accompanying them all along the way. So it's not necessarily giving them money, it's giving them time. For instance, giving bread, which is baked, or clothing to wear, or money when whilst the produce is available, not when produce is not available, so that his money is not wasted. It's not just I'm thinking about the giving in itself. It's I'm thinking beyond the giving. I'm thinking of the harvesting. I'm thinking about the next stage. That is what, that's what chesed really is. It's, it's mind-blowing. So this is, this is the story of Abraham. He is the, he is the founder of chesed. Very different than Rachamim. Mercy, compassion, is an external factor that's pushing me to be compassionate. But mercy, that's, that's chesed, kindness, that's a whole new level. And by the way, Abraham was alone. He was alone. What was different between Abraham and Noah? It says that Abraham was on a much higher level than Noah. Noah was, on a certain, was a very righteous man, but Abraham had a whole new level. Why? Because by Abraham Avinu, he never said, oh, there's no point in being there for other people. Everyone's so far away from me and so unrelevant and irrelevant. Abram was the one that reached out on a whole new level. He took each person. He says, He built himself a family. He built himself people. He, did the, he was the first outreach rabbi that went and got people in his home. By the way, it Baba, says, yes. What, like when, um, I remember this pretty vividly when Avraham, he just circumcision on himself. Um, he was with God, dwelling with God, and he left God to go take care of travelers. Exactly. That's what we spoke about in the beginning. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't. That's, yeah. that's exactly the power. Uh, how can he do that? And we explained because the, the, Chesed, kindness, is being like God on a whole new level. And being like Hashem is the point of us being in this world so that we can be like Him. You have to, you have to understand, this world is a world where we do. In the world to come, there's no more doing. It's like Shabbat. Shabbat is what we call me'en olam haba. Shabbat is what we call like the world to come. On Shabbat, there's no more creativity. There's no more... Um, making things, doing things. You're literally just being. You're just being with yourself. According to Judaism, that's the experience you have when you leave the world. There's no more creativity. There's just being. Whatever you've made of yourself till now. Whatever you prepared for Shabbat is what you'll eat on Shabbat. That's how it is in the world to come as well. Whatever you do in this world is what you eat from in the world to come. And whilst we're here in this world, the most rewarding thing that we can do is... Focus on being godly like. 
not focusing on being with God, but being godly-like. That's called clinging to Hashem. How can somebody cling to, to Hashem? Our rabbis say it's by doing things that He does. Just like He's merciful, you're merciful. Just like He's kind, you'll be kind. Just like He gives, you give. And by doing that, I can really achieve the ultimate reward of being compatible to God, which is the only good in the world to come. That's how we understand it, according to Jewish tradition. But there's, it's, it's, to me, the, the most powerful part of this is his, the way, not only the way he did it, but everything around it. By the way, he also, what he had was, he would have a special farm, which was called the Eshel. It had hundreds of trees and all types of fruits. And he would bring people into his field and he would give them meals. Vayita Eshel Avraham. He would have a beautiful uh, field and he would have beautiful fruits. And everybody that comes can come, eat by me and take whatever you want. There's one condition. You recognize where this food came from. That's why in our house when we do Shabbat, even if nobody knows the benching or they don't really know it, for me it's really, really important that I make sure that everyone joins in for Zimun for the blessing after the meal, at least for the beginning, and hit and answers Amen, because that's the whole point of this. Chesed isn't just for no reason. It's so that I can be like God, make his name recognized. And that's what Abraham did. He used to have a beautiful, beautiful field and hundreds of fruits hanging off the trees. And anyone who would come, they would take and eat. And uh, the reason why it was called Eshel the tree was called Eshel, his land. He called it the Eshel field was because it's that the word Eshel actually stands for three things. It stands for Achila, eating. Shena is sleeping. And Levi'ah is accompanying. His house was a house which fed. It let people stay there. And he, let, he accompanied people on the way out. He didn't just say, oh, goodbye, see you later. He accompanied them on the way out, which is the essence of what chesed is. Chesed is when I go beyond what's ne necessary in terms of being kind. It's doing something which I really didn't have to. It's that phone call. That's the godliness in kindness. Anyway, so there's so much more, but I think that when I put too much information in here, then it loses, it dilutes the power of what I'm teaching. So I think that that's really the, the power and the lesson here. Um, that chesed is much greater than kindness and compassion. It's the highest level of giving. And it's, it's a point where you do things in areas that you don't have to. Um, and that's, by the way, what it means to be kind with God. There's a statement, mit chesedim akono, something on those lines, where you're, you're kind with God. What does it mean that you're kind with God? Or you're kind in a relationship. By the way, one of the things for relationships that you should look for is kindness. Throughout the story of the Torah, in relationships, you look for the, the whenever there's a dating situation going on, you look for chesed, kindness. Because kindness means that there's a relationship. Kindness means that somebody's doing more than they have to. It's not that they're just giving. Because everyone gives, because I, I get back from it as well. In a relationship, I'm always thinking about myself, how I feel in the relationship. You know, this, this person's great for me. This person's going to look after me. This person's going to be there for me. It's kind of selfish, right? But not in a world of chesed. In a world of chesed, in a relationship of chesed, it's when I say, I find and I notice somebody who does things that they don't have to. That is called doing chesed. It's doing things not because I, that person has to, because then it, maybe they're doing it for their own reasons, for their own benefit. But when I date someone, how do I know if that person's real? How do I know if that person's really for me? I'm dating someone. How do I know? Maybe he's acting. Look for signs of chesed. Look for signs of things that they're doing, which is not for their benefit only. It's really for your benefit. It's outstanding. It's beyond it's not just for them, because most times they do things, it could be for them. They accompany you out the door. They accompany you to the car, or you accompany them to the car. 
That's the world of chesed. That's the sign of godliness, of spirituality, of somebody who is like Hashem in that way. Okay, so um, that was my uh, class for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it and found it meaningful. And I'd love to have thoughts, questions, answers, ideas, or things that you've heard, quotes. Tell me, share with me. Maybe tell me that you understood what I said, at least. Or it resonated. Thank you. Thank you, Becca and Ali. Um, it totally resonated with me, and it reminded me of a quote that my grandfather has uh, wrote. Um, he said, when both give and both receive, neither need envy the other. Exactly. And yeah, and I think of that a lot. And I don't know, just that idea of giving wholeheartedly and it, it can be very hard. I think we're not, we're not trained to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We have to really push ourselves forward to um, try and incorporate others' needs. And yes. I like that idea of looking for in a partner, just what you said, just at the end, I was like, wow, I needed to hear that of um, just looking for what they do that doesn't have to do with them, that doesn't have to do with what they're gaining from it, but just something purely, um, pure kindness. Right. So. I think that if they say thank you to the waiter, that's nice, but, you know, that's something that, you know, it's, it's human decency. And maybe they're doing it because they want to show you how nice they are. So it's not yet a sign. It's, it's cute. It's not, I think if they're rude, that's, that's a problem. But if it's not yet a sign, what really to me is a sign is when they do things that they didn't have to. You know, it's, and it's not about big gifts. It's not about big gifts. It's about um, you know, noticing the details of what's necessary for the other person as opposed to what's necessary for you. It, that's chesed. Chas dalet. You're, you're caring about the dalet, the other person, not just giving. Giving is with no intent. It's just, it's beautiful. The, the first aspect of giving is it doesn't have the consideration fully of the other person. But it's the way you say it, the way you, right, that's all what's accompanied with the giving, the words, the language, the, the additions, the things that are not necessarily meant to be done, and you did, that tells me everything. That's, that's godly. It's like the story, think of that story. The person went and made a phone call. It's not that he just knocked on the neighbor's door and said, come join me. That's a nice thing. That's a great story. But the greatest part of the story is the final punchline when we find out that he actually called before the holiday and, and found out exactly the tunes that that person needs. That's, for, that's, that's beyond. That's beyond. That's, human, that's humanity at its highest. Okay, anyway, so um, that was fun. I'm glad you're all here. Nice to meet you, Shayna. Welcome to the Mishpacha. Hi, thanks. It's a pleasure. Hey, everyone, everyone what, we should all welcome Shayna, I think. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome to the... Um, I was thinking before you were saying how... Yeah. Um, giving for not... Um, not for... Not for... Um, getting something back and I find for myself when I give mm -hmm. no matter what even if I know I'm not going to get something back I end up getting something back because it just like feels so good in your heart right you always get you always will get something at the end that's yeah. for sure that's for sure it's beautiful it's it's one of the most spiritual things and experiences that there is is to be a giver because it makes you godlike. God only gives. But obviously, which is calculated and it's not blind. Some giving can be very dangerous, like giving to your children anything they want. Then they come ungrateful and unhappy or giving things that damage them. A lot of times, by the way, I give things based on how I think I, I would like that person to enjoy, not based on how they would want it to be. Right, So that's, that's another case where it's not thoughtful giving, it's just giving based on myself. Thoughtful giving means I'm thinking about, and it could be the smallest thing, smallest thing. I think that's a great point because I think oftentimes people, 
we do things thinking that because we enjoy something or because we like to operate a certain way that someone else will appreciate that same way. Exactly. Um, and that's not the case. We it's not the case. need to really put ourselves in their shoes and see from, or from their perspective, what are they asking for? What do they need? Um, I've noticed that a lot with like trying to get to know someone, you can see how they might think, you know, oh, when you're stressed, you need a lot of space because they need space when they're stressed. But you actually might need reassurance when you're stressed and they give you space when you want support, right? Exactly. And exactly. That's called chesed. Chesed is not in a place where it's, uh, it's thoughtful. Kindness is just, okay, I'm going to be there. I'll be, I'll but it's not thoughtful. Chesed is the soul that's inside that's really making sure I'm doing the right thing. That's chesed. Yeah. It, it could be in any way. I've heard of, there's a great rabbi who was told that he has cancer and he's not got long to live. It was a long time ago. How did he respond to the doctor? Do you want to know? This is, you want to hear kindness? This is kindness. How did he respond? He gets told for the first time, you've got the highest stage, not long to live. He looks at the doctor with tears in his eyes and said, that must have been so hard for you to tell me. Famous story. That must have been so hard for you to tell me. <laughs> the hardest thing that you can hear. Boom. Looks in there. there. You don't just get that. That's not something you just achieve. Just like that. It's a lifetime of work. Of, of study. That somebody goes through. To be able to eventually. It's not an act. It's in the hardest emotional pain. To react in such a giving way. See words can also be... Apparently that doctor was ecstatic. I need to find the source of that story. Amazing story. Um, but yeah. By the way, if anyone wants to hear beautiful Jewish stories whilst you're driving or anything on Spotify, I came across, it's a friend of mine actually, and I never knew he's been doing this. It's called Stories to Inspire. And it's like one minute stories of all different people throughout our history. Um, given over by rabbis from all over the world. It's called Jewish Stories to Inspire. And there's about almost 1,500 stories, each one a minute or two. Um, and you, whilst you're driving, I do this every, my kids, I listen to it, I go crazy. It's the most mind-blowing stuff. Totally worth doing. That way you can accompany yourself with something meaningful and powerful. It's, tra it's transformative. It's got currently 1,819 stories on here. So you won't be bored driving and hearing them. And every day they add more. So it's Jewish stories to inspire.